Ask Mike, brought to you by the Stadium Shop on Razorback in Fayetteville. Happy Monday, everybody. It's time for another edition of Ask Mike. Courtney Mims alongside Mike Irwin here. I'm back with you, Mike, for another week. I, I know you're so overjoyed to have me back. I'm overjoyed <laughs> because August camp is over. We don't have to get up early, you know, you, like. You mean we, early we, August early, camp? Early, early, early. <laughs> it's the first day they're doing afternoon practices, and that's also because school is back. So. You probably saw all the athletes coming back to campus. The football players have already been here, but it was nice to see yep. all the students back today. So, But we have a lot of questions about fall camp, and the first one is from Wizard of Hogs, who says, with Mbake going down uh, to injury, we have several intriguing options in our wide receiver room, albeit most of them without much playing time in Division I football games. However, I have heard some say at least it's in a room where we are deep, and I disagree with that. We often have two or three wide receivers in, in the game at a time. So over the course of a game, they can become fatigued and ineffective if there's not enough to rotate frequently. Plus, over the course of the season, it's likely one or two more may get banged up. So how long did that question last? Uh, a minute? I, was that even a question? It was well, a question, but it lasted a long time. <laughs> okay, look, in the two scrimmages that they've had, I think I've counted nine different receivers who've caught passes, and, and I'm not talking about two yards or, or three or four. Most of, I mean, in this last one, there were guys catching 45-yard passes, 30-yard passes. Uh, he's identified three starters uh, that I know of. Well, two. Isaac T Tesla yeah. is one of them. He obviously wasn't here last year, but this guy is not only getting publicity inside the state, He's garnered national publicity. He's gotten national people writing about this guy saying he's going to be the, one of the big surprises of the season. Now, these guys don't always know what they're talking about, but, <laughs> but the word is filtered out. And then Armstrong, the Texas A&M con Commerce uh, transfer, tall, fast, good hands. He's probably the other. And then they're moving a guy, Jaden Wilson, who was a redshirt freshman last year. They moved him into the slot. And he's looking really good there. So those are your three starters. But look who you've got behind there. Satania, mm -hmm. right? Oh, yeah. He's not a starter. I thought he would be. That yep. tells you how deep yeah. that room is. Yeah. You know, they got the kid from Bowling Green, the six seven kid. He's not a starter. So basically, Sam Pittman said on Saturday, they're going to have a six-man rotation. Oh. So you're starting too deep at each of those positions. But I looked, went back and looked at the numbers and guys that have caught passes. It looks like there's at least two more. There's a really good freshman that looks like he, you know, is, well, did, is going to get into the mix. About talking about Davian Dozier? Yeah, who, yeah who's he's great. Like, he's fast. He's a four-star out of Georgia, I think. So that, there's one. Uh, they got the kid, the, the, the kid that caught the touchdown pass last year. Mm -hmm. His name escapes me right now. But he's, he's a good wide receiver. Yeah. So I'm looking at at least probably eight guys for those three positions. Now, look, when you start talking about any position, if you get six injuries, then you got problems maybe. But when you got a six-man rotation for those three spots, which honestly they didn't have last year, I'm not concerned about the depth in that room right now. Yeah, it doesn't seem like there is a concern there right now, especially with and, – and you mentioned this as well, but you have those, those guys who are not starters – are in the scrimmages doing stuff, right? Are in the scrimmages catching passes and, and not small passes, 45 yards or so. Right. And and so I feel like Wizard of Hogs may be forgetting about some well, of the his, other guys. The point is you've got th you're playing three guys on most plays. Well, right, yeah. So you gotta have more guys. But I don't know if he thinks there's just five or even if you're there's more than six. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. They got enough for a good uh six man rotation. And the other issue is, do they really have a six-man rotation? Because one of the things he's talking about in his question is fatigue. Yeah. So if you're not rotating guys, yeah, that's a problem. But as long as you're rotating six for three positions, you're not r really worried about fatigue, guys running out of gas. And again, I think they've got room for at least a couple of injuries. I'm not saying they'll have them, yeah. but I think they can lose at least a couple of these receivers and still have that six-man rotation. Yeah, and you even have some of the guys who are catching passes in scrimmages. 
you know, you've got the tight ends who are worked into that as well, and even the running backs. I mean, you have. Well, that's yeah, that's another question when oh, you've got okay. all these receivers, but. You've got more than just receivers in the past. Exactly, game. exactly. That was my point there. Mousetown says some guy on Facebook was ripping Dan Enos last week, saying Arkansas was 1-7 in and SEC play his last season under Bielema. He asked why we would want him back. What would you say to this guy, Mike? I'm not sure I would say anything because the people <laughs> that have an opinion like that probably aren't going to change their mind. Even if Arkansas has a great year under Enos, they probably just sit back and wait for him to have a, a not-so-good year, and then they'll say, I told you so. Um, I what I would say about Enos under Bielema is he had a couple of good years. That last year, come on, that was anybody that remembers that knows what Bielema was doing. He was shutting things down in the second half. Arkansas had a comfortable lead. The offense would just shut it down in the second half, and he was trying to win games with his defense. That's got nothing to do with Dan Enos. Uh, Enos has, has, has done this job at, I think, three other schools, been successful, has come back here, the biggest thing that I think you're going to notice with him is the way he's changing the passing game. And we were told that, but, it, but when you see what they're doing, it's really interesting. We've already talked about how they're going to take the three running backs that don't start, which are all, they're all good, yeah. and he's going to get them on the field by getting them involved in the passing game, which I think is a brilliant idea. So that's one thing he's doing. But the other thing he's doing is he's using – Receivers, running backs, and tight ends all in the passing game, all of them as blockers. And one of the things I'm going to be interested in seeing is, is if these running backs improve as pass blockers because that was an issue last year, and it looks like they're really taking that seriously. So you see all these things that he's doing, and Sam Pittman said uh, again at the, at the press conference after the scrimmage, he said, we knew going in that we had a good running game. This camp... We wanted to see what we could do with our passing game. So when you look at what they did in that scrimmage, they didn't run the ball hardly at all. No. They're just throwing it, throwing it, and throwing it. Again, that t now that's not what they're going to do when the season starts. But they're really trying to get that passing game multidimensional. And it looks like to me, again, what Pittman did was he sat down with Enos and they got together and they said, let's see if we can throw some curveballs at opposing defenses this year who think we're just going to line up and do two or three specific things. Yeah. Let's throw them some curveballs. And that's what I've seen. Because I think that, that secondary is better than people think it is. I think the linebacker core is really different. And I think we know about the D-line. I think that defense is very good, and the offense has had its moments. When Pittman goes into a scrimmage and starts off with saying the defense won the scrimmage, or automatically you got a bunch of guys mad at Eno. See, I told you, they went and got the wrong guy. They should have got somebody that won, whatever. Um, I think when he says that, it doesn't mean there's no offensive numbers. Again, 360 yeah. yards in passes. Yeah. And that, so that doesn't sound like to me that the, the, that, the, that the offense didn't do anything in the scrimmage. It just means that overall – your head coach said defense won the day, which, I, as I said last week, is good news because you want your defense this time of year to be uh, doing well in scrimmages. Absolutely, and you just mentioned it there. When you get the – we get the stats from the scrimmages, right? We don't get to go to the scrimmages. They're close to the media. But when you get the stats, all you look at is offensive stat, offensive stat, offensive stat. There were a few defensive five, stats. Five 45-yard passes. Five, in the yes, I was about to say that. Right. I'm like – where, where, why aren't we talking? But, you know, Pittman's talking about the defense. He's like, oh, the defense did really well. And the other thing is you're seeing those stats with, with all of the quarterbacks. You're not just seeing K.J. step up. Yeah. You know, you're seeing Criswell pass well. You're seeing uh, the freshman Malachi Singleton. Malachi Singleton, he, he threw a really touchdown, good. beautiful touchdown so, pass. So, uh, again, you, you, they're just in better shape, I think, than they were a year ago at this time offensively. And if you don't think – Enos can get the job done, all I would say is, okay, you can make your case in about a month. Well, that's what Let's I was look back in a month and see. <laughs> I was about to say, whoever made, I don't know if the, it was said who made the comment, but it's just interesting that people are so quick to comment on, oh, wow, it's just going to be the same old, same old with Arkansas. They haven't even played a game yet. They right. haven't even played a game yet. Once we've, <laughs> so, I, I'm just, I think that's so funny to me. They're like, ah, oh, Dan Enos, bad hire. 
How do you know? They haven't played a game. You haven't seen his offense. Well, he's basing that on what was what, well, what, what was what he, I understand that. Why, but. why are you bringing a guy back that was one and seven his last year as an offensive coordinator? That was the guy's point. So well, we'll, well, see, we'll see. All right, let him let him uh, make his point in a month. We'll see. We'll see what we'll, happens in a month. We'll apologize to him <laughs> if the offense stinks. <laughs> if the offense is terrible, we'll go right back to him and apologize publicly on the show. Uh, Kane Liffin. Kane Liffin says, I, I, interesting name there, Mike. Yeah, is that a play on Lane Kiffin? It's pr- it, it sounds like it is. Coach Pitt confuses me, he says. He keeps talking about how close his players are, always helping each other up after plays. But then he says there were several scuffles in the scrimmage. Which is it? I think this might be undercover Lane Kiffin trying to figure <laughs> out Coach Pittman here. I don't know. Look. <laughs> I've seen several examples of this, but one the one that I remember is uh, this guy Chris Harris. He's a I don't know if he's a walk on, but he's a little used receiver. He's, he's a been, freshman, I think, right? No, or maybe a sophomore. No, this guy's been here. Oh, he okay, okay. He's been here three years and hasn't played. Oh, so he's probably a walk on. But the point <laughs> is, he was involved in one of those plays in the indoor in which you catch the ball out of the backfield and then you're going to try to make yards after the catch. And Jordan Crook, who's huge. Just steamrolled him. I mean, he looked like he crumpled him. Maybe that's why I thought he but, was a freshman. <laughs> but Crook, as soon as it happened, stopped and helped him up. We've seen that over and over and over again. Both sides of the ball, but mainly the defense after a hard, because there have been some contact. We've seen it. Some hard contact. Seen guys helping other guys up. So I don't think Pittman's making this up when he says that there's a camaraderie there, a closeness. They like each other. But what he basically said about this scrimmage, and, and uh, Evan and I went over there, and you just getting out of the car in the parking lot and walking to the front door, which is about, I don't know, 150, about 50 yards yeah. maybe that we walked. It was hot out there. These guys are out on the field. And it's, there's no wind in that stadium. Wind can't blow through there. It's hot and it's humid. Mm-hmm. You just felt like the air felt like soup or something. Ew. It was just yucky. And I'm sitting in there before the press conference in the air conditioner thinking, I'm so glad I'm here and not out there watching that. So I think tempers flared after a while out there in that heat. I mean, Pittman came in and he looked like he had been through a sauna. And didn't Pittman say in the presser the tensions were high and it was also because of how hot it yes, was? Yes, so he was it saying was... it was the heat. Yeah. That just kind of got to everybody toward the end. They were all hot and tired and yeah. probably wanted, wanted to go back inside. And yeah. Then you lose your temper occasionally. So I don't think that... <laughs> What whatever happened out there was not what we've seen through most of the camp. Absolutely, I, don't I think th- I don't think he's talking out of both sides of his mouth. Yeah, I think KJ even backed him up. He was like, "It was real hot today. Like yeah. it was real tensions were high because of that heat." Hot Dogger wants to know which of the new coaching hires has impressed you the most. For me, it's Ben Souders, the strength coach. Man, he's got those young men beefed up and ready to bust a move. Yeah, he's, it's impressive to look physically at the change in a lot of these guys. But I still got to go with Travis Williams. Really? Yeah, I like what he's doing with the defense because I, I think he's about to take the big weak spot on this team last year. Well, they dead last in pass <laughs> defense. Dead last, yeah. I think he's going to take a weak spot and turn it into a positive because yeah. he's got – the thing that impressed me, he comes in – now, we, this is the first time we really sitting around. I mean, we talked to him when he got hired, but we don't get – Pittman has this Kirby Smart – Nick Saban approach toward assistant coaches. He doesn't like the media talking to him. So we get like maybe two availabilities a year with these guys. So he comes in there and he stops and takes time to introduce himself and and talk to every single person that was in that room. Took about a minute for him to do all that. So you're thinking, this is a cool guy. But then he gets up there and he starts talking about his philosophy and why there's this closeness and why this is camaraderie. And he said... We don't, we don't scream and cuss at our players. He said, I don't believe in that. He said, what I do believe in is whatever problems you have, as long as you're working to improve, as long as we as coaches see you're improving and not going backwards, we're going to be positive with you. And if you're not doing that, then you're probably not going to be on the field. But he said, at this point of the, of the year, that's what we're looking for. Whatever issue you have, are you better today than you were yesterday? And I like that. I like that attitude. 
But what I like is, is the depth I'm seeing. Because, for instance, there's a perception at linebacker they don't have a lot of depth because they they've got one kind of returning guy with a lot of experience. But I think he's got at least five players that he can put in there and rotate for two positions, at least five. He's talking three, but I, I've seen five out there that look like they could play. Wow. And I, I think we, we're seeing depth in the secondary. I think we're obviously seeing it in the D-line. Uh, I just think its defense is going to be much better. I, I do think Enos is going to be a surprise with the passing game, but I think the big surprise is going to be that defense. Yeah, I like his attitude, and the players seem to have all bought in. When you when you look at what Chris Pupal said in the press conference and the other defensive players we've gotten to talk to, they all hype up about how much they like this guy. and that, that's, they do. That's something and that, that we've heard since spring. It's, I mean, it's, it's one of the reasons Pittman has been successful, because exactly. players like him so much. Exactly, and it also made Travis Williams such a good recruiter in the offseason. I, well, I, I didn't even talk about him as a recruiter, yeah, yeah, but yeah. That's, that's another part to, yeah. to what he brings to the table, the way he's been recruiting. Yeah, I do have to say, Ben Souders, though, for me, it's, it's Ben it's Souders. Been, I do agree it's with been impressive. Hot Dogger. When they say Ben Souders, I, I have a funny story for you, Mike. When I was at practice the other day, and Jacob can attest to this, number 87 starts waving at me. And I'm like, who, who is that guy? Who's that guy waving at me? And I look at Jacob, and I'm like, Who's 87? Like, why, why is he aggressively waving at me? And he had a mask on, so I didn't, I didn't see his whole face. He walks up to me after practice. He goes, you don't recognize me, do you? And I go, oh, my gosh, it's Quincy Rhodes, the player I did the story with with the tornado in Little Rock. And he has shot up huge. I mean, he looks like a different person, Mike. And I looked at him, and I was like, you look a lot different. He goes, I know. Ben Souders, right? What about Jeff Coat? The, the transfer Coat. they got from Missouri. I'm terrified end. of looks him. Looks like he would rip somebody in half. He <laughs> would rip somebody in half. I, he is a bad, bad man. I agree with <laughs> Coach Pittman when he says he is a bad, bad man. You even look at Hudson Clark. I didn't recognize Hudson Clark when he walked into the press conference. There, and it, I was it's like, just been a big difference that Souders has made. So I do want to give some credit to him, Hot Dogger. I agree with you there. Marty Bird's proxy says, I saw your positive comments regarding Coach Williams' meeting with the press this past week, so we talked about that briefly. I've also been extremely impressed with Coach Jimmy Smith. Both seem like excellent coaches who are very humble. Besides humility, what does Coach Pittman look for in his coaches? Come on now, recruiting, recruiting, yeah. recruiting. I've never <laughs> seen a head coach emphasize recruiting among the entire staff the way he has. And the way he emphasizes is real simple. If you don't deliver, you get fired. We've mm -hmm. seen him do that. And as long as I've been here, what typically happens on a Razorback staff is there are going to be three, four, sometimes five, but I've seen as little as three or four guys that are your recruiters. They're really good at it. And the head coach just turns them loose. Okay, you go out and do this because you're good at it. And Pittman has just said from the beginning, that's not good enough. You all have to be able to do it, everybody. Even if it's one of his buddies, somebody he liked and brought here, he will still get rid of the guy if he doesn't bring the, bring the people with him. So to me, that is, that's what I see. Uh, I see a coach that has just basically said, you know, everybody's got to deliver. Everybody. Uh, and when you have that, I think there's no question What's expected of you? You know, it's like you're not going to be shocked if you suddenly wake up one day and you're gone because you knew you didn't bring in the recruits you were supposed to. So pay attention to recruiting and pay attention to who recruited who because if you see a coach over there that's not landing anybody, uh, he's on the hot seat. <laughs> Absolutely. And we just talked about Travis Williams recruiting, but that can be said for Marcus Woodson as well and Darren Wilson, all those guys. Jimmy I like, Smith. They're Jimmy all Smith. I, I like what – I think it was Marcus Woodson. He was like, we, we go out and we try and get guys who are a fit for our program, and that doesn't mean just a really talented player. That means a fit in, in the way well, we act as well and the way the, what Sam Pittman yeah. is built here. That's the big un, untold story in, in kind of rebuilding a team is everybody looks at your five stars. You get five stars, yeah. and we've seen some complaints. Arkansas gets too many three stars and some four stars, needs some five stars. Uh, there are three stars that I'm telling you are five stars. Yeah. Uh, D-Mac was a four star when he, when he when when Arkansas recruited him and when he got here, we realized he was probably the biggest five star I've ever seen. That guy I saw him play in high school. He was a total stud. 
The reason he was a four-star is because he let it be known he was coming to Arkansas early in the process, so nobody else was after him. And the way those recruiting gurus work, they just go, oh, there's not too many coaches looking at him, so they just kind of blow him off. It's terrible. And uh, they're, they're, look at Tesla. Yeah. This guy was playing at a Division II level. Yeah. And... I don't think he. I think he was a zero star out of high school. Yeah, I'm. I'm not sure. And he now, had like I say, they're, they're talking about him in national publications. So you can't just look at a five star, four star of what you've done in recruiting there. I know we do the rankings and all that stuff, but I'm just telling you what you just said about identifying a fit. We need this kind of player in this situation, and then they go out and find that guy, and he turns out to be the fit you were looking for. Armstrong yeah. and Tesla are two examples of that at receiver. Yeah. I mean, you could go in and identify a couple of receivers. Tyrone Broden also coming from a smaller school. I, I just love the fact that it's also identifying that fit. That starts with the coaches. That starts with who Coach Pittman surrounds himself exactly. with. And they all it all goes together, right, Mike? So I like what you said there. Eddie Lynn says, this time of year, everybody is making predictions. They are, Mike. We don't like predictions, do we? I predict that our dub... We'll have more yards receiving than rushing. How about it? How do you like that one? I've said before, I know this guy, <laughs> and he's pretty smart. Eddie Lynn? Yeah, yeah. I know him. Okay. He, he's the Arkansas fan in my hometown when no, nobody else was an Arkansas fan. He was, That's Eddie Lynn? Yeah, he was okay. a guy in, in, in the 1960s. He loved Frank Broyles. He loved Arkansas, and he still follows the Razorbacks and pays attention to what they're doing. And he knows, I've talked to him about what's happening with those running backs. And I think he's, he, he knows Dependian from last year, knows what he can do. And, and I think what he's basically saying is he's a guy that can catch the ball, take a look at the tight ends out there blocking, maybe a receiver, you know, maybe a, you know, a, 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 a guy in the slot out there, three or four guys are blocking, and then he sees the seam and boom, he's gone using his ability to cut. And I think basically what he's saying is he's going to end up, because he's not a starter, so he's going to well, end he up. Well, he might, he might he's be. He's not a starter in the, in, in, at running back. Okay, all right. And he's saying because he's not in there getting reps where you're carrying the football as a rushing running back, he's going to have more yards passing, more yards receiving than, than rushing, and I think he may be right about that. See, because I that's interesting because I was reading, I think it was Otis's article today where he was talking about the depth chart, and he's like A.J. Green and Rashad. I mean, it could go either way with what, who's in that two spot after Rocket. Yeah, but I, I, don't, I don't think you're going to just see him line up running two backs all the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, true, true. So well, yeah. They'll, they'll do it some. They're going to be, they're, yeah. It'll be a multi-look backfield, but again, I'm – I like his point, which is you may see this guy with more passing yards than rushing yards. This I think year. I think that's a I think that's a very valid point. We could see a lot of those running backs getting a lot of receiving yards, especially well, how it's been the, the last scrimmage. two scrimmages. Go, go look up at Saturday scrimmage and look at some of those totals. Yeah, I mean, what was there? Two running plays that we saw that they gave us, like yeah. AJ Green and. And we Rocket don't know and... what happened. Maybe there were more than that, and they just didn't include it. I yeah. don't know, but. Well, again, that, that's we'll find out when the season begins right. kind of thing. Jimmy Mitchell says, I heard you say several times that you watch games on TV with the sound down. Are you serious about that? It would drive me nuts. How do you know what's going on? How do you know what's going on? I know you your know, answer. You I know, know sort of the same way you know what's going on when you actually go to a game in person, right? You use your eyeballs. Yeah. You see it. You go, oh, okay. He did that's this. What's going he did on. that. There are very few things that when you're watching television, you really need those announcers for. Because here's what happens. Let's say there's a, there's a, a replay thing that comes up. Well, you can see it. Yeah. You're sitting there watching, and all of a sudden there's a delay, and you see they're looking. Up. Then you can turn the sound up and kind of figure out what they're talking about. But then you turn it back down. Um, so if, if I'm watching with the sound down, and I see the camera suddenly focusing on some guy on the sideline, some player over the – then I know there's some issue there. And I may turn that sound up just to see what's, what are they talking about here. Oh, okay, that. So, that, yes, there are some things that happen when you're watching a game on TV that if you turn the sound down, those guys have people feeding them information about what happened here, there, there. And so you might miss some of that. But the, there are usually visual clues about that. I've gotten good at that because I hate... <laughs> 
99 percent of the chatter yeah it's coming from these announcers so i just turn it down yeah i mean i think you have a point there i, I do think it's interesting when you go to a baseball game though and you do see people with their headphones in and they're listening to the broadcast the radio broadcast i don't think that's the worst thing in the world because i think that's well, kind of fun a, to it's a personal yeah but yeah. what are they what are they listening to are they listening to a tv broadcast no, no or a radio they're listening broadcast? to a radio that's right. broadcast so there's a difference so maybe you could pop in an earbud mike and listen to a radio broadcast of the game while you watch well but there's a delay on all that's this stuff true. so it'd that's be out true. of whack yeah it would be out of whack you're right bad idea then well just just keep on muting just keep on muting the tv blake well, taylor you guys don't let me do it here <laughs> So, because we got because all these monitors can, over in the corner. We have all the monitors, but we're also working, and I have to listen, right? right when so, I have to put up with it when I'm in the I'm studio. Sorry. It's, a, it's generally only on Thursdays. If I'm off on Thursdays and there's a Thursday night game, which then, you, usually, then you mute it. Then I turn the sound down. Or sometimes if Arkansas is playing at 6 o'clock, I don't come in here till 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon. You watch an afternoon game. And I'm game, watching yeah. those morning games yeah. before I have to come to work. Yeah. That's, that's where that happens. Absolutely. Blake Taylor, eleven twelve says, I always felt like playing a home-and-home -home series is good for both fan bases. Can you give me five teams in each of the three big sports that you would want to see an Arkansas schedule in a home-and-home -home series? Mike, we don't have a ton of time, so you can't give me five in all three big sports. Well, look, I... I <laughs> I don't like this whole notion of you've got to you've got to play home and home, which what that really means is you're going to go play a team from another Power Five conference instead of a mid-major. That's what he's really talking about, and he's saying that's both good for both both teams. Yeah. All right, Arkansas is fixing to play uh, in 2024 in, a, in an expanded SEC by adding Oklahoma and Texas. In other words, it gets even more difficult. And now there's all kinds of pressure. We talked last week and the week before. The network people want you to upgrade your non-conference schedule to do what he's talking about, home and home. Because home and home means you're playing somebody that's good enough that if you're going to play them at your place, yeah. they expect you to play them at your place. Absolutely. Uh, I'd, I'm just saying, if it's up to me, I would tell the networks, I'm sorry, but we're not going to take an already tough situation and tell all of our member institutions you've now got to upgrade your non-conference schedule just because you don't want to give us more money. I mean, I don't I think if ESPN wants to wants to SEC games on the on on ESPN, you play a little hardball with them. I mean, that that thing goes w both ways. Yeah. So again, I say all this while acknowledging that, yes, we're probably headed toward that situation where more and more you're going to have to schedule home and homes mm -hmm. uh, in your non-conference games. Because, I mean, conference games are home and home. If you're playing a, a conference opponent, it goes back and forth every year. So who – I'll just limit it to football. Who, who yeah. wh wh Which direction would I go? I think you need to play teams – that are close enough that your fans can go to those games. That would be the only advantage. Okay. If you're gonna, if we're, if you're gonna say we got to do this now, so I'm talking TCU. I'm talking Oklahoma State. Yeah. I'm talking maybe Kansas or Kansas State. Okay. Maybe Texas Tech. I'm not talking about Florida State. I'm not talking about Oregon. I'm not talking about Clemson. Clemson. I'm yeah. not talking about Wisconsin, where you have to go a long distance and your fans aren't going to travel. I think if you're going to do that, and a good way Arkansas could do it, and I've talked about this before, is to continue that Jerry Jones game, but continue and it, do it with, as a, as yeah. a, a non-conference game. Yes. And then what you can do is play those uh, Big 12 schools in Texas. You can play Baylor. Yeah, you it technically isn't Houston. a home and home. You can but play Texas Tech. Well, it's it's not. A, it would be a home and home in that if you do it two years in a row. In other words, well, you're, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's say if you play Texas Tech and one year it's your home, their home team and the next time they're the home team. <laughs> Mike, See, wouldn't that be a good thing? Yeah, it'd be fun, but it's, it takes away the home and home because part of the home and home. What, what did he say? It's good for both teams. Why should Arkansas worry about what's good for some other team? I don't care about them. <laughs> I mean, I don't care. I mean, and I'm not going to feel sorry for some team like Missouri State that agrees to play here and gets a bunch of, gets over a million dollars. I don't know, it's way more than a million, but gets a bunch of money bunch to come money, here and play. Yeah. I don't care that they have to come here. Well, that's their problem. That's true. But look, you look at, like, because we talk about the TVs, right, the TV networks, I think they would love a game where it's a marquee matchup between, you know, something like Florida State. I mean, if they played, like, Florida State or Clemson, I mean, that would get eyeballs. It would. Yeah, I just don't so think – I just – I would not favor 
playing a home and home with them with those guys, for, because yeah. of the distances. I think there's other teams you can play where your fans look. I don't. My thinking is not toward the TV people. I don't I care know, about I know, the TV I know. people. I care about the fans, and I care about what's good for them. And I still remember the old days when fa and the best thing about the old Southwest Conference is you could travel fairly easy. When Arkansas got in the SEC, it got spread out all over the yeah. place. I used to go to games in Fort Worth. I used to go to games in Lubbock. I used to go to games in Waco. I used to go to games in College Station, and I would see a lot of Razorback fans down there. There's an old uh, video from 19, I think it's 46, with, with Clyde Smack Over Scott. And it, it's the oldest color film, wow. I think, in the archives. And I've looked at that, and there are lots of Razorback fans. In the 54 game against... Uh, Arkansas won that 1954 game against Texas in Austin, the so-called Little Pigs. When Arkansas, when that game is over, they come, the fans come down out of the stands, and they got almost that whole fi uh, field filled with Razorback fans in Austin. That's the way people used to travel, and I would like to bring that back. I realize everything's about TV these days, but I still like the live gate. Yeah, I, I do as well. I, th I think you're right there, Mike. It doesn't benefit fans who want to see the game in person, but for eyeballs and TV purposes, I'd, well, just, you know, for br building the brand. I think I could, I can see what Blake Taylor's saying for building the brand. Okay. All right. All right. Well, we'll agree to disagree there. S. Giles wants to know, and I love this question, who won the back and forth NIL debate on the internet between Hunter Juracek and ESPN's Jay Billis? For those who didn't didn't see that exchange, I mean, <laughs> Hunter Yurchek is basically saying, look, something's got to be done about NIL. We have no rules in it right now. It's just a wild, crazy mess. So let's have a few basic rules. What Billis is doing is taking that and turn it into, oh, you're trying to cheat players out of money, which is not what he said. Um, because... A guy like Jay Billis, he, he's always going to be lobbying, lobbying for whatever political point he has. This is the problem that ESPN has right now. I don't know if you've noticed it or not, but ESPN is losing subscribers. A lot of people can't figure out how they're going to come up with the money to pay the SEC for a new contract because they're losing subscribers. You know why they're losing subscribers? Not because of the games. They're losing subscribers because people don't like Sports Center. They don't like all these pop-off artists. If I'm working for ESPN, my job is to cover sports, not run around making political points all the time, which is what they do. And what Billis is trying to say is, players have been getting the shaft for years and years, decades and decades. Coaches are making all this money, ADs are making all this money, and players are getting nothing. I've talked to guys going all the way back to the 70s about this issue, and believe me, scholarships back then weren't anything like they are now. Used to not even have, have a, the, the, they had a, a, an athletic dorm where you ate. That was part of your room and board. Your food was at the athletic, well it was closed on Sunday. So you had to pay for your own meals on Sunday. So what do you do? You know what happened? A lot of players had fans that had become friends with them. They knew about them. They'd invite you over for dinner. You go over and with the wife and kids and have a great meal at somebody's house on Sunday. There was a way to make it happen. It wasn't just like, oh, the athletic department has given us the shaft. I don't have anywhere to eat on Sunday. They, they figured out a way to make this happen. Mm -hmm. Players weren't, weren't running around mad saying, oh, our coach makes this amount of money and we just, we don't, we don't get, we're, we're undervalued. They weren't saying that. But now all of a sudden in this modern world, players are always getting the shaft. Let me tell you what you get with a modern cost of attendance scholarship. You get your tuition, which I don't know if anybody's noticed, but college tuition in the last 30 years has skyrocketed. It's a, it's so that's expensive. a lot of money. Yeah. That's, there's a lot of value to that. So you get that tuition. You get room and board. But now it's not room and board in an athletic dorm. It's room and board. Get your own apartment. And, and, and here's enough money for you to just go eat out if you want to, whatever you want to do. So there's that. And then they have spending money, which used to be laundry money, which was like $30 a month or something. Now they're getting seven, $800 a month in just spending money. All right? So if you took NIL and made it what I think they should do, which is make these uh, scholarship athletes employees, part-time employees of the university, mm -hmm. 
take your NIL money and spread it evenly among all 450 people that are on scholarship. If you give, what if you gave each one of them another two thousand dollars or three? Yeah. So now you got four thousand dollars a month in spending money, and you're getting the shaft. Are you kidding me? But again, some people are going to say, well, why should a really good player just get four thousand dollars a month when your athletic director is getting a million dollars a year? I don't know. Why does somebody that works for a giant corporation and just went to work for them get $80,000 a year and the guy that runs that corporation gets $4 million a year? It's called capitalism. It's the way it works. You work your way up. And these guys are getting a college education. 30 years from now, when they've been in the business world or whatever, they'll be making good money. And they're, But the point is, they're not. it's not like they're not getting a good situation now. Mm -hmm. What the ultimate effect of this is, and what Billis can never figure this out, and probably just, if it, it's just not crossing his brain. So let me just lay it out. Let's take this thing the way, what he wants, which is players make as much money as possible. Okay, here's what we do. Pull each of these football teams, major co conference football teams, out of the university. You're no longer associated with the university. It's just a, it's just a football program. Minor league football, like we have minor league baseball. So the University of Arkansas, they just rent the stadium. None of their football players have to go to school. They're not going to college. They're just getting paid money to play. And we do that everywhere. You ever watch minor league baseball? I like the naturals, yeah. but Caden Wallace was over there. How many people do you think were in the stands? I don't know. 800, <laughs> 900? Maybe. It doesn't draw. <laughs> If you did this, if you changed college football like this and, and, and took the college part of it out and turned it into just a business, that's what you would end up with. And this is what guys like Billis can't figure out. They want to take something that has worked for a hundred something years and say, there's something fundamentally wrong with this. Athletes should be making a half million dollars a year because look how much the athletic director makes. They don't get it. Mm -hmm. You're not taking fans into consideration. If you change the sport this way, you're going to lose fans. And that's why ESPN is losing subscribers, because of those idiot philosophies, people not understanding what makes somebody like to watch college football. Yeah, I, th I think you're right on that. I think you have a point there, because there is something to be said about when athletes were not making millions and millions and millions of dollars it's just, it means a little more. I mean, you talk to athletes years ago that say playing was so much fun because not everybody makes it to the pros. The main not everybody reason, goes there. The main reason I ended up here, the year before I came here, I covered the Dallas Cowboys. I hated that. I thought I would like it. I grew up in Texas. I, I love Bullet Bob Hayes and, and Don Meredith and mm -hmm. all those guys. But that year covering pro football, I realized it's just a business. It's a, it is, yeah. They weren't yeah. excited after no, a win. They no. weren't in there celebrating. They were just... They still get, well, they looked Mike, they still having, get paid. They still get paid. <laughs> they looked like having to do those interviews in the locker room, they looked like somebody had made them go to the library or something. It's yeah. like, oh, I got to do all this stuff. There was no in excitement among these guys. Okay. And I got up here... And I ran into Frank Broyles, and I saw his enthusiasm. I saw the players and how they acted and how they were responding. And I went, this is what you cover. Because this is about people that play the game the same reason high school kids play the game, because they love it. When you take it and turn it into something else that's just about money, yeah. changes it completely. It does. It does. I think the whole thing, and, I, and I'm on the side of – I do want athletes to get paid for their name, image, and likeness. Because sure. I felt like I feel like if it's your name, like you know, and somebody else is making money off of well, it, there's a that's way to do fair. that. You that's sell jerseys fair. and you give them part of the money. Exactly. I think that's fair, but it does take a little bit of what you love about college football away if you turn it into the NFL, right? You know, yeah. if you turn college well, basketball into you the got NBA. A quarterback making five million. How much does does uh, What's his name? Manning make right? How much? Oh did he gosh, get? he's the six million, seven million. I thought I saw. How nuts is that? Yeah, it's insane. He's not insane. even going to be the starter. No, it's insane. It's insane. Ugh. It's insane how much money these athletes are. Bronny James. Bronny James is making millions it's of dollars. It's just crazy. It's crazy. It's wild. Uh, Larry Hamilton says, "I think it is 2025 when we're supposed to play Arkansas State. Why is that game in Little Rock? Jonesboro is 60 miles closer to War Memorial Stadium than Fayetteville. If they want to play us so bad, play us in our stadium." Um, 
Well, it's because they have a contract with Well, but you'd have to know so. what went on behind the scenes, and we can't know that. I have, Hunter Juracek hasn't talked about why he came up with that plan. Yeah. Because I said for years, if they ever do play Arkansas State, it needs yeah. to be in Fayetteville. They yeah. want to play you so yeah. bad, okay, come to our place. So here's what I'm told behind the scenes, and I'm not confident that these people know. I don't think Juracek has come up to them and said, hey, psst, here's what I'm doing. But they put two and two together, and here's what they've come up with. The contract with War Memorial ends in 2020. There's not, it, it will either have to be extended, there will either have to be a new contract for 2026 and beyond, right. or it will end, right? Correct. That's what I, uh, they, okay. I went to War Memorial, they have a contract, that's when okay. it ends, yeah. Look at what, what pressures they're going to be under if they extend that contract. We've talked about this whole business of having to play tough, better teams, no more rent-a-win teams and all that stuff. Okay, mm -hmm. let's say Arkansas does play Clemson as one of their non-conference games. Do you think they're going to play them in Little Rock where they've got 53,000? You could probably get 80,000 people in, in, in uh, Reynolds Razorback Stadium. So the point is there's all kinds of reasons why well, as wonderful as War Memorial has been, and nobody was a bigger supporter of that place than I was. Mm -hmm. The atmosphere was awesome. Yeah. When I got here, it was the place to play a big game. It slowly changed, and it started to change the day Frank experienced expanded Razorback Stadium. It just it just changed. And nobody's to blame for that. How is Little Rock going to fund what's necessary to turn that into an 80,000 seat stadium when they're playing one game a year there? You can't it makes no sense and there's not anything else you could put there. If there was a pro football team at War Memorial then that, it would already exist for that and you could play one or two games a year there and it would make sense. But there's just no way to do that. Yeah. So I, I, I've conceded for a, a, a several years that contract is probably going to come to an end at some point. So what people are telling me is Hunter Juracek had this plan where he said, okay, everybody for years has wanted to see Arkansas and Arkansas State play. It's never happened. Okay. Guess what? We're going to play them, and we're going to play them in War Memorial where their fans can come and our fans can come, and it'll be awesome, and we'll, finally this thing everybody's been waiting for will happen, and then guess what? That's the last one. That's because it, yeah. when the contract is up, they, they think what will happen is once that game is over, at some point, Juracek comes back and says, look, we were, and if, here's what I would do if I was him. I'm not, I, I'm not saying he takes my advice because he probably doesn't, <laughs> but if I'm Hunter Juracek, this is how I handle that hot potato issue. I go to Greg Sankey at the SEC office and I say, look, man, do, can you do me a favor? Can you come out with some sort of a league pronouncement that because of the pressures with the network people and, 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 and doing home and homes and not playing mid-majors and all this, games will no, games must now be played on campus. So you can't play a game off so campus. So basically force them to not do yeah. it anymore. It might, it might mess up the Jerry World thing that I talked about. But if you have a reason, you know, well, look, it's out of my hands, but, Greg Sankey. But, but, that, said. but that wouldn't happen because you have games, you know, like the Georgia-Florida game that are played in the Jags Stadium every year in Jacksonville. Be. They wouldn't be able to do that. So uh, you you, do something. I don't you, know. You I, need to be able to blame it on somebody else. But if, <laughs> And I'm not saying this is his or, plan. Or could War Memorial, I don't know, because I was there this weekend, Maybe there's expansion. They're always changing. They're they're always that's trying to other, change that that's stadium. That's the other possibility that they come up with something that that'll make yeah. this work. And I'm not saying they won't. I'm just saying what people are telling me is the reason he was willing to play Arkansas State there is because that's going to be his big ace when it's all over. So we gave you the biggest game ever in yeah. state. True. Okay, I can see that. Among I just, in state I teams. just feel like you know after learning the history in 75 years. I mean. It's kind of cool that they, they do play a game there. You know, I think that is pretty cool. So I would like to see that maybe move forward and maybe. So you're, but, a, you're an advocate, uh, advocate of continuing to play at War Memorial. Yeah, I am. I am an advocate. I, just, I don't see how but, they can but do it. But with expansion. With exp I, I, oh, where are they going to get the money for that's, that? Uh, don't you die. know what we're talking about here? A lot. Three, three a lot out of $400 million? Dollars? Yeah. Where are you going to get that's who's a great, pay for that? That is a great question. For one Mike. game a year? Yeah, I guess. Or maybe maybe you come bring some other, you know, 
high profile. Oh, no, you'd have to get a team to come yeah, in you'd here have to in get the a NFL. Team? Not, you don't have the. You don't <laughs> Can you have imagine the, a Little Rock NFL team? You don't have the fan base for yeah. that. You don't have the population. Oh, we'll see what happens with it. Armand Abbey says it seems each of my friends has a different reason for disliking Missouri. I didn't really feel it until they hired this annoying coach they have now. I saw this video where he landed some big shot recruit and he was running around squealing like a six-year-old at a birthday party. He's my least favorite SEC coach. He might be yours too, right, Mike? Well, that was Drinkwitz, and I've explained it before. The reason I don't like this guy is because of the way he treated the offer he got. And I'm not saying Juracek offered him a job, but he did want to talk to him about the job when Morris was fired. This was a very critical point in the history of this football program. He's from Arkansas, and I felt like he disrespected mm -hmm. the state by what he said. So I don't, you know, once you make me mad, I'm gonna stay mad at you. Yeah. And I don't care much for Missouri anyway. However, on this particular deal, <laughs> yeah, you know, you land a five-star and he's under job pressure. I'm telling you, if they have a bad year, he's probably gone. So he's running around squealing because he's probably thinking, hey, I might just save my job. Here's the only problem with that. <laughs> they showed that same player like two days later. There was some kind of an interview I saw on Twitter, and he's basically saying, yeah, but I'm still looking at Oklahoma. So, so you know, oh, you're no. around squealing oh, and going no. crazy, but the guy's not totally in, you know, he, he may have committed, but you know what that means. It, if, if Missouri starts having a bad year and OU's has a good year, maybe he's flipping. <laughs> that is not a good look for him, so... <laughs> I need to see that video. You've talked to me about this video, but I need to watch well, that guy, video. guy, you know, I had seen it, and I'm like, whoa, what's that? I'm, I'm watching it after the show because I need to know what you were talking about here. Pat Boat asks, could you name three people or stories from the university that deserves a documentary? Ooh, well, we've like done uh, Frank's been done. Um, Nolan's been done. Mm -hmm. I did one on John McDonald. You did one on Lance Harder. Yep. So that's all your national championship coaches. So who's left? <laughs> Who's I'm going to go Norm DeBryan because yeah. he had an incredible career. What people don't know about Norm is he built that program from they, – they had stopped playing baseball. Yeah. And he brought it back and started off playing games at the American at, – at, at a city park or something or maybe the fairground. I think it was, they had a baseball field at the fairgrounds. And that's where they started playing when he got here. I love that. And uh, – and he just built the program back and went to the College World Series multiple times and really set it up so that when Dave Van Horn came, he wasn't inheriting a pile of junk. He was inheriting a good program. So, so I'd say Norm. I'd say Van Horn yeah. because I still think he's going to win a national championship. And then I'd say Musselman. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I think you might need another year or two, but those are the three I would think would make good documentaries. Well, Norm would definitely make a good one, especially because when you talk, when we got to sit down with him and and Van Horn, it was great. Uh, that was awesome. I mean, that was so. Well, he cool. tell that story about <laughs> Dave Jordan walking over Walk. the top of his bed when he was sleepwalking. They were so funny. I mean, and getting all three of those guys together, you could even do. I mean, the stories. That even Van Horn and Nor and uh, and Jorn had about Norm, Norm. were great too. Yeah, so about he was so bad at throwing batting practice. Nobody wanted. He said <laughs> nobody wanted he would Norm hit to throw guys in batting practice. <laughs> I love it. I just that one. That is a documentary. I would absolutely love to watch. Yeah. So I agree with you there. Somebody needs to make that one. And our final question of the day is from Hog Redneck, who asks: So Courtney painted the eyelash on the hog at War Memorial. Yes, I did. Do hogs have eyelashes? Wouldn't it be more fun to paint the slobber on the slobbering hog? Well, first of all, it wasn't the eyelash. No, it, it was wasn't the eyebrow. The, no, hogs do not have eyelashes. Well, maybe they do. I don't know. I haven't seen a hog this one up close. Ha, the, the one on the logo has an eyebrow. He, I never noticed it yes. before, but he does. Look, I'm going to pop up the picture right now so everybody can see in the edit of this. Look, the hog has a little eyebrow. I never noticed it, but it's a very cute little okay, eyebrow. Now my question is, you painted it. What if people now look at that and say, it stinks? You screwed his eyebrow up. If They're going to blame it on if you. If somebody goes to War Memorial and gets a high-def picture of that eyebrow, I want it. I'm thinking if you did a really bad see. job... He was probably being nice to you, and if you did a really bad job, he probably corrected it after. Well, you he left. can't. Cor he said if you mess up, it takes a because this is turf field. It, it's it takes a while to correct it. So uh, please don't can, mess they up. They can figure it out. They can. Get they some can. Green they paint can figure it, out. figure it out. They can figure it out, but it takes a little while. But I did.
didn't mess up, Mike. Okay. I didn't mess up. I, I, the slobbering hog would be cool to paint, though. But that's, that's not Slobber a Slobbering hog has always been associated with Razorback basketball. I want your check to bring it back. Yeah. I'm not going to give up until I bug him to death. But they need the slobber hog at, at midcourt yes. with Bud Walton. But that's a basket, to me, a basketball logo. The modern running Razorback probably still needs to be in football. I so agree with you No there. slobber hog. At no, football, no football. slobber hog, and it might be hard to paint. I don't know. Maybe I'm not after painting you that. Ribby, that. You need ribby for baseball. You do, yeah, exactly. I still want to see that slobbering hog on the center court, though. That I mean, would that great. would be so cool. I love cool. that pig. Maybe in the Bud Walton renovations. Maybe, 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 maybe your so. check will surprise us. Yeah. Maybe it'll make Razor fa Razorback fans all happy by doing it very, very soon. But we'll see. We'll see. That's going to do it for another edition of Ask Mike. We'll see you next Monday to answer more of your questions.